Take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. When I was starting out in the ministry and in preaching of the Word, an older and wiser preacher said something to me and that I have never forgot. He said, Steve, you're starting out in ministry, and here's, here's a piece of advice that I will give to you. He said, everywhere you look, you'll find a sermon. And I never thought about that too much until a couple of weeks ago. I was in my home, and my wife has placed a picture on the wall, and this picture says, be still and know. Now, I have gone and I have looked at that picture a hundred times as I've walked through that room, and but a couple of weeks ago, the Lord just, it almost like he hit me over the head with a brick saying, be still and know. And so I felt like that that was going to preach to me, and so I felt like since it's going to preach to me, I just need to preach it to everybody. Be still and know. And really, as I was looking at that particular part of that verse, the Lord was simply saying to me, He said, Steve, stop striving, stop fighting, stop trying to do things all on your own. He was saying, be still, which means to get quiet, to sit tight. And really what He was trying to tell me was just to let it go. Some of you in this audience today need to just let it go. I don't know what that is, but you know what it is in your heart. But God was also telling me something else, and this is really what I want you to understand and what, you, what I want you to get today as we go through this message. God wanted me to get to know Him better. You know, as I've been in the ministry 42 years, I feel like I know the Lord pretty good. But as I began to began to focus on that particular phrase, be still and know, I began to think and began to feel in my heart that God was saying, hey, there's a whole lot more about me that you don't know. And wouldn't it be nice, Steve, if you would just get to know me a little bit better? You know, that may be some of you in this audience today. Maybe you need to get to know God just a little bit better. Now, men, there's some things, well, everybody, there's some things that we need to know, right? Now, men, you better know when your wife's birthday is and when her anniversary is, right? We better know how to do our job. That's important that we have knowledge about our job and how to do it. We better know how to drive. <laughs> Some people don't, it seems like, but <laughs> we need to know how to drive before we get behind the wheel. And just the other day, I was sitting in my wife's car and I was sitting there with four grandsons, one of them in my lap, and Brooks, my youngest, he was holding onto the steering wheel, and he kept turning around and looking at me and saying, I'm driving Mimi's car. I said, okay, but it's not on. But he still turned around, I'm driving Mimi's car. One day he may drive Mimi's car, but he's not going to as a two-year-old because he doesn't know how to drive. So there's some things that we need to know. But listen, seriously, there's something that you better know. You better know if Jesus lives in your heart today. Do you know that? Do you know it for sure? Now before we go into the text here in Psalm 46, I want you to look at uh, a passage that kind of illustrates what I'm talking about here so far this morning. Luke chapter 10, notice in verse 38. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her, to help me. But Jesus answers and said to her, now listen, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Folks, what's that one thing that's needed? I believe it's just to be still and know that I am God. Look at 
Look at Psalm 46 and verse 10. The Bible simply says, Be still and know that I am God. Job in Job chapter 19 verse 25 says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. The Apostle Paul states in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he says, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him even until that day. I remember in the third, third or fourth grade, I know a lot, of, a lot of things I don't remember, but I do remember this particular thing. We, we got to go out and play in, at recess, and one particular day, the teacher said, now boys and girls, we're going to go out and we're going to play freeze tag. Have y'all ever played freeze tag? All right, there's one hand that said they played freeze tag, but a lot of heads nodding, and that's good. She said, we're going to play freeze tag. And you know, the, you know the thing behind freeze tag, she'll say go, and you start going, and then all of a sudden she yells freeze, and you have to stop wherever you're at. And I think I stopped something like this. And you have to hold that pose until somebody comes and tags you. But the problem was nobody ever came around and tagged any of us. So we're there like 20 minutes just like this. Well, the bell rings, and the teacher says, let's go in. So we go back in the classroom, and we're saying, well, nobody ever tagged us. She said, well, that's the only way I can keep you boys still. <laughs> Pretty good trick, right? Well, maybe some of us need to freeze a little bit today, right where you're at, and get to know God a little bit better. Would you like to do that? Now, in this particular text, I want to give you a little bit of background. Many Bible scholars, and I believe this, I uh, believe the context of this psalm was probably a deliverance of Jerusalem from invaders. And we'll find those details in the 18th and 19th chapter of 2 Kings. There was a king, his name was, get this, Sennacherib. Now moms, you need to write that word down. You might want to use that at a birth one day. Sennacherib. He was the king of, of Syria and what he did, he marched against Jerusalem and he laid siege upon Jerusalem during the reign of good king Hezekiah. Now Sennacherib, he, he boasted a lot. He was very proud of his army, and he boasted about his army and his might and his power that he had. But he also ridiculed Hezekiah and his people, the Jewish people. And here's what he ridiculed them on, for relying upon Yahweh to save them. Now think about this king, Sennacherib, coming and making fun and mocking King Hezekiah and saying, so you think Yahweh is going to save you? Have you noticed the might that I have? Do you notice the army that I have? And you think God is going to come through for you? Well, Hezekiah, King Hezekiah was very concerned about that as any king would be. But God used the prophet Isaiah to come and comfort Hezekiah. And he also reassured them that although things look very grim, God was still in control. And I want you to turn to 2 Kings 19. 2 Kings, I want you to see this. You know it's right after 1 Kings, right? 2 Kings chapter 19, verse number 19. And I want you to see this prayer that Hezekiah, King Hezekiah prayed. Notice this. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. What a prayer. And we're going to see in just a little bit that that prayer was answered. So Psalm 46, it is a psalm of deliverance. It is a psalm of protection. It is a psalm of the power and providence of God. And it was actually a song that they would sing and celebrate who God was. And so I want you to see four things that you need to know this morning. You'll see it on the board there. You need to know God as a refuge. You need to know God as a river. You need to know God as a responder, and you better know God as ruler of your life. And so let's take that and let's begin in verse 1 of chapter 46, Psalm 46, and we begin reading in verse 1, and we'll go through verse 3 to begin with. The Word of God says, God is our refuge and strength, 
a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. In other words, there may be an earthquake that happens, and that's about as bad as it gets. But we're going to be okay, he said. Though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, maybe a hurricane that comes your way, but it's going to be okay. And it all goes back to that first verse, knowing God as a refuge. Do you see that? Notice the first two words in that particular verse. Verse number one, it says, God is. It doesn't say God was, amen? As if that day had already passed. It doesn't say God will, or it doesn't say not that God will, uh, as if that day has not come. It says God is. It's in present tense. God is today. God is right now. And when you think of that word God, you think of that name of God, it is the name Elohim. It is the same word that we find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, come on, God created the heavens and the earth. It is Elohim. It is the triune God. He said in verse 26 of chapter 1 of Genesis, let us make man in our image. Speaking of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so he's talking about the triune God. And when it says God is our refuge, he is talking about the fact that the enemy is going to have to go through all three to get to us. Isn't it great to know that the enemy has to go through God as the Father, has to go through Jesus as the Son, and has to go through the Holy Spirit to get to us? Folks, I think that's, pretty, that's a pretty good refuge. What do you think? But I find here a few things about this refuge. I see here that it is a personal refuge. Our refuge. God is our refuge. I find in Psalm 23 verse 1, the Lord is what? My shepherd I shall not want. So it is a personal refuge. It has a personal touch to it. It is meant for you and your ears today. It is your refuge. In Psalm 57 verse 1, the Bible says, be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will make my refuge. Now, what is a refuge? We need to define a refuge. It is a place to go for protection. A refuge is a place to go and a place of trust. But not only is it a personal refuge, but it's also a powerful refuge. The Bible says here, God is our refuge and what? What's the next word? Strength. That speaks of the power of God. In Psalm 27, verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I believe Ramona just sang about that, didn't she? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then in Psalm 18, verse 2, the Bible says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. He's my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. So I believe this word refuge speaks of a powerful refuge. Not only a personal refuge and a powerful refuge, but also a present refuge. As you look at this verse, it says, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. He is here. If you're a child of God, He dwells within your heart. He is there. And the Bible tells us there that He is a very present help. He wants to be encountered today. He wants to be known today. And He wants you to know Him intimately today. I want you to know this about this present help. His help is enough. You know, we, we look for help all the time, but when we go to the Lord God, I want you to understand His help is enough. His presence brings security. But not only is He a present refuge, but He's also a protective refuge. It says there in the last part of that verse, in trouble. You ever been in trouble? When I was a kid, I stayed in trouble but it was my brother's fault. Always, always. But this particular term here in trouble speaks about being in a tight place. Have you ever felt like you were in a tight place? 
You ever felt like your back was against the wall? A rock between a, you ever been between a rock and a hard place? That's what this is talking about. But God says, I'm here to go to bat for you. I'm here standing for you. He is a protective refuge. Now, verses 7 and 11 kind of give us an idea of this. Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And you see that word tagged on the end, Selah. And you'll notice the same wording in the same ending, Selah, there in verse number 11. Now, that means that we are to meditate upon that. We are to think about what has just been said. Now, listen. I hope you know this today. I hope you know that God is with us. You know that, right? God is with us. So we need to know God as a refuge. But secondly, we need to know God as a river. Look in verse number 4. Psalm 46, verse 4. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. Verse 5, God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, and the earth melted. I believe what those verses are talking about is that there is an outpouring of God's blessings just waiting for you. And I believe two of those uh, blessings are mentioned or referred to in this passage. And the first one is this. It is the blessing of grace. Aren't you glad for God's grace? Aren't you glad that God's grace is bountiful and plentiful for you each and every day? It's like grace flowing like a river from the heart of God. Now I want you to notice something. It says there, there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. I believe that's talking about there is an infinite supply coming from the throne. Of God. Now let me remind you of some verses. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So you're in that tight spot, you're in that trouble spot. Listen, go to the throne of God, and you can go boldly to the throne of God. You have access as a child of God to the very throne of God. God is not a God of just enough to get by, amen? He's a God of the plenty. He is God that has an infinite supply. Now you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. And he asked the Lord several times to remove that, but the Lord refused to remove the thorn that was in his flesh. And, but Jesus said this in verse number 9, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And then that great verse that you all know, and if you don't know it, you need to get to know it better, and it is this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, And my God shall supply all of our need according to what? His riches by, in glory by Christ Jesus. Now break that verse down a little bit. My God, here again, that's personal, shall supply. That's positive. All your need, that's, a, that's pointed. He has directed that to you. It is plentiful according to His riches in glory. And it's also powerful in Christ Jesus. So we see that grace flows like a river from the heart of God. But there's also an unfailing comfort that coming from the heart of God. In verse 5 again, it says, God is in the midst of her. You know what? God wants to be in the middle of your life. In other words, God wants to be the center of your heart. God wants to be preeminent. And if He is to be preeminent, He will be in the middle, in the center of your heart. I love that, that phrase, in the midst. Now think about it. The tree of life was in the midst of the Garden of Eden. He appeared to Moses in the midst of the burning bush. He overthrew Pharaoh 
and his army in the midst of the sea. He was the fourth man in the midst of the fiery furnace, where two or three are gathered in his name. The scripture tells us he is in the midst. And listen, even in death, Jesus was in the middle of two thieves. So my friends, God wants to be in the middle of who you are. And from his heart, he is pouring his blessings out to you. So we see God is a refuge, but we also see God is a river giving you grace, giving you comfort. But I want you to notice number three. I want you to know God as a responder. Now we're familiar with that word. We hear it quite often when, when 911 is called, you have the first responders. Oh, listen to me. Isn't it good to know that God responds to your life? That God responds to your every need? And in verse 8 and 9, I want you to notice what it says. Come, behold the works of the Lord. We have a call to behold. We have a call here in Scripture to look at the works of God. Have you ever just taken time, and we sang that song, Count Your Many Blessings, just Just sit down and think about what God has done for you, how He has responded to your life. And here it says, Come, behold the works of the Lord who has made desolations in the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Now do you remember the prayer that Hezekiah prayed just a moment ago? There in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 19, it said, God, would you save us from their hand? Would you save us from the hand of the enemy so that all the earth would know that you are God? You want to hear the answer to that? How many want to hear the answer to that? Listen, here's how God responded. In 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35, it says, And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out And he killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. I love how God puts the number in the book. There was 185,000 Assyrians surrounding King Hezekiah and his people. But here's what happened. (laughs) People went to sleep one night when the people arose early in the morning. There were the corpses. And they were all dead. Did God come through? Did God respond to that prayer? Listen, will God respond to your prayer? Now wait a minute. Some of you are already saying, well, I've been praying about something for years and God hadn't responded. Oh, I I think He has. Maybe you're not praying in the will of God and He has just said no. Maybe He is saying it's not just time just yet. Now these people went to sleep that night. They didn't know what they were going to wake up to that night. But listen, God responded to the prayer of that king. Not only is there a call to behold here, but there's also a call to believe. Notice in verse 10 and verse 11. Be still and know that I am God. Listen, I want to ask you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he's God? I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Listen, I do not believe we will know God as we should if we don't get still. Be still and know. I want to illustrate it with with a story that you're very familiar with. The story of David and Goliath. Now listen to me. Saul knew Goliath, but he knew Goliath more than he knew his, he knew about God. Now stay with me. It seems to me that Goliath knew what or Saul knew what Goliath was up to, but he he didn't know what God was up to. So his knowledge of of Goliath kind of outweighed the knowledge that he had of God. And the Bible tells us that Saul heard the voice of Goliath and he and his men became afraid at the voice of Goliath. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 17 verse 11, they were dismayed and they were greatly 
afraid. And it reiterates it in verse 24. It says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. Now I want you to get this. But when David came on the scene, you remember David was just a young boy. He was doing a service for his dad, feeding his brothers. But he came on the scene, and boy, was it a different story. David was filled with the knowledge of God, and he didn't even know who Goliath was. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 17, verse 26, he says, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of God? Now what's going on here? I believe David knew exactly who God was, and he didn't have a clue who Goliath was, but because he knew who God was, he knew what God was going to do to Goliath. Amen? He believed in God. And so David says this in verse 45 and 46. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, you come to me with a spear and with a javelin, and I just know David probably had it in his mind, Goliath, is that all you got? And then David makes this incredible statement. He says, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Lord of hosts, in verse 11, speaking about the same God. The God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied this day, this day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. Hey, did David kill Goliath? He took that. He took that stone and he swung that uh, and that slingshot and hit him right between the eyes. I'm going to tell you, God directed that stone and took care of that. But you see, Saul knew more about Goliath than he knew about God. But David knew more about God than he did Goliath. And I'm going to tell you, when you know more about God than you do about the circumstances of life and about the things you're going through in life and you don't understand those things, but you know more about God, hey, He's going to come through for you. He's going to respond to you. Why? Because you're putting your faith and your trust in a living God who is going to take care of the enemy. And one day, He's going to take care of our ultimate enemy uh, for good. Amen? We'll see that in just a minute. So we've got to believe in God. But also you must believe in His plan. Verse 10 says, He is God. Be still and know that I am God. Listen, we have a future that is sure. We have a future in heaven one day. And listen, I love that plan of God, don't you? But we also must believe in His presence. And if you'll notice there in the last part, or the first part of verse 11, it says the Lord of hosts is with us. That is referring back to the term or the name Emmanuel. We love that name, Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God is a refuge. Do you know him as a refuge? God is a river out of which is flowing grace and comfort to you today. Do you know him? God is a responder. Do you know him more than you know of the cares of this life? And then finally and lastly, You must know God as a ruler. Again in verse 10, be still and know that I am God. I am Jehovah God. I am Yahweh. I am Elohim. I am He who provides for you. Now I find this, I find something interesting as we look at verse 10 and 11. In the previous verses, verses 1 through 9, we find that it is in third person. But now in verse 10 and 11, it shifts to second person. And what that means is the point of view shifts from the third person to the second person. In other words, instead of writing about the Lord, all of a sudden the Lord addresses us. So listen to me this morning. If you don't hear anything else, listen. God is speaking to you right now. He is saying, be still and know that I'm God. Can you do that in your heart and in your mind right now? Can you just let every thought, everything else get out of your mind right now and just think about God? Be still and know that I am God. I want you to understand something. 
He says here in verse 10, he said, I am going to be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Folks, I want to find myself on his side. Amen? Because he is ruler. Now listen. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 through 11, listen to these words. Therefore, God has highly exalted him. Does it not say in verse 10, I will be exalted? This says, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Is He your Lord? If Jesus, if you've asked Christ into your heart and and, uh, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, then He is to be the Lord of your life. But I want you to know something else. He is going to be the Lord of it all. He will rule and reign supremely. I want you to turn just two more passages. Philippians chapter 19. Please hear this. Philippians chapter 19, verse 11. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were written were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now listen to me. If you're a child of God, there's going to, uh, there's going to be a rapture that's going to occur. You're going to be raptured out of here. We're going, to be, uh, we're going to join those who have died in the Lord, and we're going to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and we're going to be there forever. But at the end of the tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back on a white horse. And we're going to be riding, with ride ho- riding on white horses with him. And we're going to see what he is going to do is he is going to judge the world. And then he's going to put his foot back down where it belongs. And he's going to rule in Jerusalem for a thousand years. A thousand year reign of Christ. Folks, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about that. And he is going to be ruler, and everyone is going to know who Jesus is. Now, in this particular passage in in Revelation, it speaks of three titles, faithful and true. That talks about his eternal existence. It speaks of the Word of God. It talks about his uh, incarnation, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But at the last, it says in verse 16, and on his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Folks, that's the title Christ will have at his second coming, designating his role as the supreme ruler of the earth. Do you know him as a ruler today? Final verse. That is a prophecy can, that we will go back to in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7. Listen to this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Amen? Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, in the zeal of the Lord of hosts, there's that phrase again, will perform this. My friends, today, do you know God as your refuge? Do you know Him as as a river? Do you know him as a responder? But seriously, do you know him as a ruler? Be still and know that I'm God. Would you bow your heads?
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the blessings of this day. And Father, you spoke to my heart when I began reading in this passage in Psalm 46. Lord, that I need to get to know you better and get to know you more. And Lord, I, I'm sure there's folks in this congregation today that really have that same issue. Lord, they need to get to know you better and get to know you more. And God, I've tried the best that I could to explain it and convey it. And God, I've just left it on the table. And God, I just pray you'll use it. I pray the people have eaten from the food that has been given today. And I pray, Lord, that they will respond to your call, respond to your conviction, or whatever it may be. Lord, I pray that you will do a mighty work in all of our hearts this very day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? If God is moving in your heart, you come. We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.